Are the farmers active themselves at advertising their product? Ours are a little bit, but they're not as much. Um, and so what we, what we what, what my contribution really is, mm -hmm. is to market and educate. And so we provide a direct link to the fishermen, um, and they, and that allows them to basically focus on raising fish, and we're able to take on all of the, the education and the marketing for them. Um, and that's, that's generally the case with all of the CSAs and CSFs around the, the country, is where if you don't have the farmer being the person that's actually spending the time to get customers, raise awareness, you have somebody that's helping them. And so it, all, of the, all of the middle people essentially come down to a, a couple as opposed to the long, the long chain. You know, it, what prompted my question is thinking about like all the independent sellers on eBay, yep. right, who, who leverage this technological tool and I guess, you know, big, I don't know, exposure internationally for their goods, like, you know, some dude in Iowa in his garage wouldn't be able to advertise to a guy in New Hampshire necessarily on his own, right? But with eBay and Craigslist, you know, there's a precedent for these local sellers being able to get their goods really anywhere, you know, in, in providing those connections. So, Drew, does this tie in with what you're doing at all, like in building these networks of people? And Yes, in a sense it does. Um, yeah. It's basically like leveraging technology to create like a bottom-up economy. Yeah. To fill in the gaps left by the traditional economy. So it's quite creating a parallel economy. Yeah. Since um, I, what I'm doing, we're trying to, it's a lot of problems that's existing in economies around the globe. And um, there's three of them. Uh, one of the first is there's a lot of underutilized labor, knowledge, and goods um, in our communities. For example, um, the Associated Press reported in April 2012. One and two college grads are either underemployed or unemployed. Um, what else? I think oh, close, either close to half or over half of millennials, that's age 18 and 34, are underemployed or unemployed. And I think 80% of the products that people have in their home they only use once. Um, the other problem is it's a high failure rate for startups. I think it's three out of four startups fail, and that's either due to a lack of capital or a lack of support. And then also there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of cutbacks into, um, into government, social, environmental programs due to the financial crisis that uh, you know, a lot of governments are facing. So uh, I was thinking about, um, let me get back, I always wanted to create a game. Anyone here ever played the game The Sims? I don't know if yeah. that's The Sims in China. Is there like a Sims like in China? Or like something similar to it? Can you explain what the game uh, is? Like a, it's game? like a game where you can create like a like a create your own city or an alternate reality. I don't. I mean, you can create an alternate version of yourself, yes. right? Like a synthetic. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, basically, I wanted to create something like that, but for entrepreneurs. So, like a game where you can create like a startup in a virtual world and collaborate with other players as well. But I didn't have the knowledge and the resources to do that, so I just placed it in the back of my mind. Um, and that was like in 2008. But in 2011, I came across this TED Talk by Jane McGonigal. She's a game designer. It's about uh, how a game can create a better world. And that's how I learned about reality-based games, where you can take game design and apply it to the real world to solve problems. Because uh, a lot of people don't know this, but a game is the only force in the known universe to get people to take predictable action without force. So an example is like happy hour. The hmm. bar doesn't force you to come there and get, you know, get a drink. They give you a reward, and then you know they give you a reward, and then you come there. If an organization or a person can keep creating these situations, they're suddenly guiding you on the journey. A lot of us are not aware of that. Um, but then I also became aware of alternative economics as well too. Um, concepts such as like worker cooperatives, worker-owned companies, uh, social entrepreneurship through uh, Grameen Bank and microfinance. Um, and I also became aware of like mutual credit. Anybody here ever heard of that term, mutual credit? It's basically uh, uh, where communities can create their own currency, where it's not created in banks or government. It's like people come together and create their own currency. In a sense. Some examples like time banking, time banks. Uh, I think the largest, one of the largest time banks are in Japan. It's like 300,000 people create using the time bank model. But uh, there hasn't been any companies focusing on the, the millennial demographic or college students. And that's what I started producing is doing. Um, so basically, I create like an economic model that has all these new concepts 
worker cooperative social entrepreneurship, mutual credit, crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, and put them into one kind of reality-based game. Uh, and it consists of like an, an online incubator, and that's the sense to help uh, startups, you know, gain feedback and have like a community to, you know, help develop their ideas. It's also like an online marketplace that uses, you know, alternative currencies such as time banking. So like, for example, uh, let's say you are a, you, you are a startup in, in college and you need a web designer, but you don't have cash to pay me. I'm a web designer, we're both part of this network. Instead of paying me with cash, uh, it takes me five hours to do your website. The name of our currency is called Finny, F-I-N-I. So you pay me, uh, take me five hours to do your website, you pay me five Finny. Now you owe five hours of your time to someone else in the network, something else. So say she needs your service, you can pay, you can, she can pay you the five Finny with, with your time. Uh, it's a video I like to show to give you an example of how it works, of how like third and third, fourth graders are creating their own mini economy. We're gonna do the same thing on college campuses. I think uh, Sue. Yeah, let's play those videos. This is a great transition, by the way, to how access to information can affect social entrepreneurship. Yes. Right, so really nice <laughs> transition there. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, in this, you know, if you can, if you can give people an overview of what, uh, how do you say it, protocism? Uh, uh, well, the economic model is called producism, and our startup which implements that model is called producia. Okay. And this right here is just a couple short videos on how elementary students are creating their own mini economy, creating their own businesses, their own currency, and uh, applying what they learn in the classroom to the real world. strategies that the students use during their mini economy day. Same 
we want to take that same kind of process, but uh, this is the last video. And saying they want to be an entrepreneur. Oh, well, uh, this is a video of students saying they want to be an entrepreneur in a sense. But basically, we want to. If we can, if third and third, fourth, and fifth graders can create their own mini economy, why can't college students or self-directed learners create their own economy as well and use like a currency that's based on time compared to traditional uh, traditional currencies? Um, and yeah, so uh, that's a little bit about what we're doing. How, how do you, you know, different people's time is worth more yes. or less? Yes. How do you navigate that? Well. We have a quad currency system, so it's not just one currency. Yeah. The first currency is called experience points. So like in games, anybody familiar with experience, XP or experience points? Yes. In game? Okay, we're, well, the more, uh, the more things you do in, the, in, this, in this network, you, you build, you gain more experience points, you kind of unlock different levels that give you more higher spend limits and more purpose. So that's one of the currencies. The next currency is called time dollars, where everybody time is equal, but that keeps it uh, tax exempt. So it's not that currency is not taxable. So, uh, uh, so that was the example I used with the, the website example. Um, the next currency is like a called a, it's like a barter currency. So it's like business to business. So say for, say for example, you're a hotel and a radio station, and you need some advertising, but you don't got cash to pay. You can pay my company these credits and get free advertising on the radio compared to using cash, but it's not convertible to dollars. And the last currency is called Finny Plus, which is similar to like Bitcoin. Anybody heard of Bitcoin before? Yeah. But it's not, uh, it's not backed by gold or, it's like a digital version of gold, but we partner with different local credit unions to basically uh, like hold reserves. So if someone want to convert the dollar or convert Finny Plus to dollars, the, you know, we get a transaction fee and the local credit union get a transaction fee. And it's an actual lo uh, local example here in Massachusetts on Berkshires. I don't know the actual city is in, but they have a currency that's like over two million in circulation there so far. But once again, that uh, this new these alternative economics hasn't been focused on the millennial, the millennial population that, or college students. So that's what we want to bring that into. But to answer your question with the time example, uh, everybody knows in advance. Okay, if you want, to, you know, if you don't want to pay you know, taxes on this on this payment, everybody time has to be equal, and it's been recognized by the IRS three times as well too. Mm -hmm. What, uh, what advantages do alternate currencies have over conventional currencies? Well, uh, interest-free, so you don't have to worry about interest because that's the thing is, say if I loan you $10, right, or let's say $1,000, and you had to pay me back 1500 where does that extra 500 come from? How can you pay it back if it doesn't exist? I have to compete with other people to pay you back. So that's the problem with traditional currencies is there's compound interest debt. Uh, so with our currency, they're interest-free as well, too, so that's one of the main advantages. Um, the other advantage is their social currencies, so it, it weaves community back together to kind of force you to meet other people in your community because you need them to, you know, provide services or goods that you need. Because today, a lot of uh, businesses we go into, we don't know the owners, we don't know the people that's working there. With a, you know, by using local currencies, that kind of encourage communities to reach out to each other and work together and collaborate as well, too. How do, you, how do you make profit if you don't have interest? Like, how um, We have membership dues. So we're a cooperative, we're a hybrid cooperative, so we're owned by the members and we're, we're, uh, members and the workers of the company. So imagine Facebook. Facebook is like an information bank. They take your data and sell it to advertisers and you don't, you know, you don't get a return on that, but you get like a free service. But imagine if Facebook gave you a percentage of their revenues because you are a part owner in that company. So that's a, a, a little example right there. Sorry, Chichi, I'll go ahead. Yeah. Can you talk about the, the size of this alternative um, um, economy, uh, what, the number of people, the, the, the sort of, can you convert that to dollars, what kind of economy are we talking about, what size? Okay, um, well, we're starting our pilot project, the largest university in Virginia, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, so it has over 40,000 students. And we're taking the, you know, the pro same, same approach Facebook did, start with uh, universities, and also online universities like MOOCs and Skillshare.com because we want to supplement traditional and self-directed learning by giving students an, an environment to practice or apply what they're learning in class, just like the kids are doing in the mini economy. Um, as far as you know, how big the economy is, it just started right now, but uh, like for example, uh, uh, the Berkshire example, they asked two million in circulation there, but once again, they're using kind of they're not really using technology, they're just using like traditional banking system. 
Um, I think if you apply in like the social networking aspect with the local currency aspect, it can help it, you know, grow a lot faster. And uh, I think, does anybody know what the most viral product ever is? Money. Money is the most viral product. And money is technology, is, money is really information. Money is an agreement by a community of people to accept the medium of exchange. It's not a piece of paper, but a lot of people just think it's something tangible, but it's really just information like numbers flow to. Do you think at some point like the uh, drug dealers will take uh Bitcoins? Oh, no, well, no, because you have to be a member of the cooperative first. With uh, Bitcoin, you don't have to be a member of anything. It's just all free market. But uh, in order to use the currency, you have to be a member of Producia first in order to, that, in order to use the currency. And then you pay a real money membership fee. You, well, it's, it's, it's like a, a DIY path and an accelerated path. So, for example, in Farmville on Facebook, you can basically grow your own farm on your own time, but it takes longer. But Or you can pay to grow your farm faster. So that's, we're taking that similar approach where we're gonna have like a Skillshare class that teaches students how to create a new economy startup. And that helps accelerate your path in this real world game that we're creating. Or you can once again take your own path and you know take more time, but that's one of the revenue streams. But we also gonna have transaction fees for you know when you're using the, the, the dollar-based currency. Um, and we're, we also have like a crowdfunding platform, someone like Kickstarter or Indiegogo, mm -hmm. but we're different because uh, we're like a royalty-based crowdfunding compared to pre-orders or equity-based crowdfunding. They have, you know, this legislation called the Jobs Act where uh, uh, crowdfunding websites can help startups raise capital by offering equity, but that law still hasn't been passed yet. But with, with crowdfunding, it's looked at as a loan, so it doesn't need any. Uh, regulation from the SEC or anything, so it allows everybody to participate in the investment process of startups, because for example, with Facebook, a regular person couldn't get in the IPO when they credit investors. So, and I think there's no other websites that offer royalty-based crowdfunding as well, so that's one of the little uh, features of our game. What would you say the, the main attraction is to a user of your service, to use it over just conventional money? Um, well, one, I look at it as like a real world game to help become your idea itself. It's like you can create, uh, you know, in games you have avatars, it's like you create your own avatar. Like, what is your ideal self? What do you want to become? And this, this is if a user is playing your game. Yes. Right? Okay. Yes. So the game, again, is uh, we, we have our members go on certain missions. So, say, one mission can be. Uh, go on the site and find four other team members to join your micro cooperative. And once you, you know, complete that mission, you get XP points or experience points to help you unlock different levels and help you have higher spending limits and more perks and, uh, more perks and benefits as well. Too. So, uh, so basically you go on these different missions and this is how we're subtly guiding players back on down a journey. And they're picking their own journey because the three things that make games very fun is autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy, choose your own path. What do you want to become? Mastery, we help you, uh, you know, uh, better your skills, help you develop you know, your skills, and then purpose, have an epic meaning behind what you're doing, meaning you're participating in a network that helps create an economy where everybody can benefit, not just a tiny minority. Hmm. But your, your service also provides a, a real alternate currency, or not? Yes. Well, okay. all the currencies that we offer are real. It's just, if enough people agree to consent to use it, that's what makes it real. Because it's the dollar, okay. we just consented to, you know, to agree to use it, but there's other ways to use other currencies as well, too. Uh, once, once again, money is just an agreement. It's not something physical. So, for example, Facebook. Yeah. Facebook had Facebook credits. They have over a billion members. If they was using, like, a mutual credit system, they can instantly create a global parallel economy just like that. Huh. Where they have, you can... It's, and it's uh, global as well as not just local. So it's like, we're taking like a global approach. So it's like locally based, but globally connected. And you can be able to travel and use alternative currency as well too, compared to only depending on cash. Now we're not trying to replace the dollar, but it's examples where you can complement the dollar. So say for example, like a local mechanic wanna fix your car and you can pay the labor and the finney and pay the parts cost in dollars. So say it costs a thousand dollars and the label is 500 and the parcel is 500, you save 500 by being a member of our network compared to paying $1,000. Are people using that now? Well, not in that. We, we start our prototype 
uh, is coming fall, but yeah. it's been small scale startup. It's been other uh, uh, projects around the world that's using it. Like half a country, Argentina, used an alternative currency because the peso was so high, you know, inflated in 90, like early 90s or early 2000s. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, one of the biggest case studies back in the Great Depression was using a town called Wurgel in Austria. It was 30% unemployment, and the local and the mayor uh, created like a local currency that had a feature called Demirage on it. Demirage is treating money as food. If it's not used, it, it loses value. So that gives you an incentive to want to spend it, pay your taxes, or invest it, or donate it. And that's when the, uh, well, well, basically once they, once they started using that uh, currency, it was no unemployment. Uh, people will pay their taxes 14 times faster. The money circulated 14 times faster than national currency, but the Austrian bank, that, you know, that was taking some of their market share away, so they shut it down. And, but nowadays, people are you know, more aware. You, know, you have like this, uh, these monetary activists that's coming together. For example, like in Bitcoin, Bitcoin has over like a billion dollar market cap now, so that shows like how a digital alternative currency can kind of scale. Mm -hmm. but it still uh, it doesn't address the uh, the scarcity problem because Bitcoin is designed to be scarce, and we want to turn money into like air. We want to open source money where everybody has access to it, as compared to only you know going through middlemen all the time to get you know. Because basically, money is our credit. We're kind of like paying bankers to lend us our credit back to what we already have already. Because basically, our signature creates that money on the loan. It's not. It's not the bank's fund. It's our money that they're uh, they're charging us with interest. Well, sorry for kind of people. Well, how how do you prevent people from just creating finnies? You know, like what determines the initial number of finnies that I have when I start in your system? Well, starting off, that starts at the, the, the white card level. Like I said, different levels, and we have them based on cards. We have white card, green card, red card right now. But in the future, we're going to have more, more levels. When you first start off, you have three Finney hours on your card. It's kind of like the onboarding process where you go in the marketplace and buy different things that you need or want. Yeah. Um, then you can apply for the green card. The green card is you have to uh, deposit or pledge 20 hours into this you know, virtual bank in a sense. And you have access to seven of those hours. The rest is kind of like an escrow account or held for you and released to you once you unlock different cards. So like the white card is the, the maximum you can have on there is like five Finney hours. The green card could have 14 hours. The red card can have 21 hours. So the higher you move up, you have higher spending limits. And spending your credit limit. Yes, and you're yeah. building your reputation and trust at the same time as well too. Okay, huh. interesting. I, I, I have a prototype, I don't know if you're trying to show people, but we have like a prototype that people are interested in seeing. Yeah. I, well, another thing I, I wanted you to discuss a little bit is um, just the idea of protocism. You know, what does that mean? You know, this is a, a kind of a theory that you've developed, right? Yes. Okay. Well, producism is like, we look at, uh, I look at an economic system that's similar to like a computer's operating system. You have Windows and Linux. Right now, our, our economic system is based on something like a Windows-like structure where you have private interests that control it. We want to turn, we want to create like a parallel economy that's based on like Linux, with more open source. So, uh, and it's upgrading, upgrading our uh, economic system to the digital age. Because right now we're using like an old economic system, you know, in the 21st century. Um, and basically, it, it, it has more focus on a bottom-up approach compared to a top-down approach compared to the tra traditional economy. Um, and it, it it combines 11 economic concepts into one comprehensive model. So one is gamification, which is the foundation of it applying game design to the real world, social entrepreneurship, worker cooperatives, crowdsourcing. Uh, that's like Wikipedia, for example, a lot of people contributing to one project. Crowdfunding, uh, education 2.0, which is like you know, game-based learning and learning by applying to learning, or like kind of have more of a focus on their own practice compared to theory. Uh, what, lean startup, uh, cause-based new media, so it's all these it's 11 looking out concepts into one model, and then we have like an online platform that implements this model. Because you have like a lot of economists that create these theories, but they don't really play any part in the implementation of them. You know, they let other people implement them. So I want to create like a flexible template and start 
applying it on college campuses first, just like how Facebook did, and then eventually open up into entire communities. That's a little the basis of it, but it's based like a bottom up, using the web to create like a bottom up economy, in a sense. And it's a hybrid economy, so once again, it's not trying to replace the traditional economy, it's trying to fill in the gaps left by the, the traditional economy. Hmm. Do you think like, do you think by participating in this economy, like it extends people's ability to, I don't know, do valuable actions in their life? Like couldn't they, you know, you, you gave some examples of services, right, that you may not be able to afford in money, but you could pay back in other ways. Yes. So is your idea that th this program makes people more capable to, to do things they want in their life? Like, you know, if, if, if I need to fix my car and I just don't have my money, I don't have enough money to do it, but I need my car to get to my job, this enables me to do it. Yes. Right? Like it, it, okay. Yes, and nonprofits would love this because they could pay their volunteers in time, time, uh, time hours because they're short on cash, but they do have something, and they can use these time dollars. And also, um, at our this parallel economy helps recognize uh, value that's not being recognized in the dollar economy. For example, volunteering that's you know has value to some people, but it's not you know recognized in GDP. So we're creating a parallel economy that recognizes a lot of value that's not being recognized. So once again, one in two college grads are underemployed and unemployed. I think it's over, I think it's close to like 31 million unemployed people in America. So imagine if you had an economy that they, they can participate in immediately compared to waiting, trying to find jobs in the traditional economy. So just, it's just giving people, it's giving people the opportunity to make exchanges that normally wouldn't happen by only using one currency. Because if you notice, all countries, they use one monopolized currency to pay taxes in. Now, if there was another way you could pay taxes and, and alternative currencies, that can solve a lot of problems. And uh, I think one of the first local governments that's using a, a digital currency to pay in taxes, and uh, it's called the Brixton Pound. They have their local council is accepting taxes and they're paying a percentage of the government workers and this local currency in addition to dollars as well too. So that and that can also help governments fund social and environmental programs that they can't fund in cash as well too. So. Right now, governments are borrowing money at interest from central bankers when they can create it directly themselves and spend it in circulation. There's a lot of case studies that have been done in the past, but it's just been held under the radar for some, some you know, certain reasons. Hmm. And I, I, I wrote a book on this, so it's, it's free online if you want to read it as well, too. It's called as producism.org. You can read it online for free. And if you want to read it offline, you can pay for a printed book or ebook or whatever, but it's free online from the reader. Do, do you foresee any, um, any conversion between regular money and your money? Well, yeah, with Finney Plus, that gives people an uh, uh, opportunity to convert Finney into dollars. We're going to partner with local credit unions, just like the Berkshire huh. example I uh, um, mentioned earlier. And that's a case study that shows how it works. Once again, it's like two million circulation in this one local area. Yeah. But they haven't really took like a you know a, a web 3.0 approach to alternative currency like Bitcoin or something like that. So, and with college students, they they are you know already acclimated to technology. You know they are big on you know social causes and entrepreneurship. And so I think it makes sense to start with students first and then open up into entire community. Is some of this program based on like historical economies, like way back when before the yes. advent of money? Yes. Yeah, is this what early societies did? Yeah, actually people think, you know, uh, at first it started barter, money, then credit. But actually, uh, this book by David Graeber, the first 5,000 years of debt, he says actually the first kind of money was mutual credit, was based on trust, where you had these, uh, they had you recorded money or old, you record a transaction on, on clay tablets um, in these temples, and basically they didn't carry, you know, once again, they didn't carry like small pieces of silver. They had these clay tablets where they, you know, ran, like, ran, you know, ran up tabs and say, you owe me this, you owe me that. But coin money was created through uh, kings as a way to pay their military to get certain items from conquered countries. And then that also gave, you know, you know a way to, for the king to kind of tax the conquered countries as well too by using like a gold based or gold or silver based currency. But once again I don't